Okay, welcome back, my wonderful students. We got a lot of stuff to do. We we um, boy, it's been a fast semester. It's almost summer. I'm ready for summer vacation. I don't know about you guys. Oh yeah, definitely. Boy, I tell you, it can't come fast enough. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about this, this the end of last week or this this next week and going into finals week after that. Um, officially, the last day of semester classes for everybody is Monday the 24th. That's a day, uh, a, week, a week from yesterday. But for us, it's this Thursday, April 20th, our, our last actual day. Okay, it'll be lecture 28. It'll be our last lecture. So if you're a newbie... As many of you are, uh, uh, don't uh, send me a message in web courses saying, hey, Dr. B, do we have classes next Tuesday? Because next Tuesday is uh, study day, dead day. Uh, so nobody has classes of any kind. And Thursday, same. Next Thursday, no. And actually, uh, are you, guys, you guys are going, you guys have your final next Thursday. A week from Thursday, so um, we're going to get you, try to get you guys ready for that. Uh, so, uh, anyways, our last lecture is this coming Thursday. We'll have homework tonight. We'll have regular homework Thursday night, due on Monday uh, at midnight, and then Thursday night we'll also have a big mega review homework, and that will go to the end of finals week. Uh, so you can use it as a study tool. And I'll convert that into a few bonus points uh, for you. Uh, SI will be going um, henceforth in the normal schedule. And actually, this is the normal schedule that I I, uh, look, I showed you guys, you know, most of the time. But actually, for the next four SIs, it's actually this way. So uh, Thursday, uh, this week, Friday, and then Two Mondays, two Monday sessions. So lots of studying in SI to get you ready. Uh, and actually, this is good because you'll have all of the lectures um, by one, all, all lecturing will be done by 120 on Thursday. So the SI that starts Thursday at 130 over in Engineering Building 1. Uh, you'll be able to get ready for the final. And then the Friday and then the two Mondays. So this is uh, actually looking pretty good. Uh, also, in terms of SI, there's going to be, go ahead and make a note of this, uh, there's going to be an SI final exam review on Tuesday next week, a, day, a week from today. Uh, but note the time, it's in the middle of the day, 11.30 to 1.30, 11.30 a.m. to one. 30 p.m. Uh, over in the Student Union Pegasus Ballroom. All right, now it's going to be a big review session. And as I always say, if you can just go to even half an hour and then you have to bolt, uh, that's fine. You know, so if you can go for all two hours, good. If you can only go for 30 minutes and then you have to uh, take off, that's good. Or if you can only... Feet off the furniture, Javier. Gosh, that's all right. You can put your feet back up there. Um, anyways, uh, you should see the things that uh, the things that I observe you guys do, and you're not you don't even notice it. I mean, you don't even really think about it, but sometimes it's just funny stuff. Uh, anyways, so as I say it, try anyways try to make it to some of the SI review. Or the regular ones. All right. Questions about SI and so forth. Go ahead. Josh. Josh, you're you're a freshman, right? <laughs> Josh, the freshman, is asking me whether the final exam is cumulative. And of course, on the syllabus, there's an answer for that that we went over from the first day of class. Anybody know the answer to Josh, this, the newbie's question? 
Taylor, you're right next to him. What is the answer? Yes, it's cumulative. It's everything. Since January, the first lecture in January, all the way up till Thursday. All right. So, yeah. All, I, and I know some instructors are not, they don't do it that way. That's how I do it. All right. Oh, by the way, uh, I want to reinforce something with you concerning the final. It's double the size of a midterm. So it's going to be 100 points. So think, you know, like 85 click, uh, Scantron questions and then 10 clicker questions, a total of 15 points or some variation of that. Okay. So there'll be about double of what you have on a midterm uh, Scantron wise and about double what you have on a, a midterm clicker wise. Except for exam three, which we did inside WebCore. But um, for the regular Scantron and clicker exams one and two, just double that for the number of clicker questions and Scantron questions approximately. Now, I don't, I don't have the uh, final exam written yet. I always write it after the last lecture. Uh, but it'll be, some, it'll be 80 or 90 dots. So you'll be going, the, you'll cover the first page. And then you go all the way onto the second page and cover most of that. And then you have some clicking. All right, so you've got to have your clicker. Uh, and, uh, but the thing about it is we have a three-hour exam period, two hours and 50 minutes, 170 minutes. And so really you have a lot more time than double. It's almost triple time. And so, so if you feel the least a bit of rush in a midterm, you're definitely going to feel plenty of time on the final. Now, you may feel nervous for other reasons on the final, but for time pressure, I don't want you to feel pressured about it, okay? Because it's, it's kind of nice that way. Uh, Abigail, question. It, the question up front here is, are you still going to have formula matching and stuff? And the answer to that is yes. It's going to look like a lot like a midterm, but just twice as big. And, but it's good. And also, but so it's not going to have as many in-depth questions as the midterms uh, because it, it's cumulative. Okay, so it's not the size. To, to have it be exactly the same level of depth and breadth as a midterm, I'd have to, it'd have to be three and a half times as big because, you know, we basically have three midterms and plus another half of a, you know, another week and a half of class. So, um, so it would have to be like a three and a half hour test if I wanted to do that. So, but it's, so actually making it cumulative means I'm easing up a little bit, of, although there still will, will still be some brain burners on there. Many people's brains will fry. On, on that day, that terrible day. Another question about the final. And if you're, yeah, Danielle. Special study group leaders, I'll be talking, uh, I'll go to the next slide. Um, you guys will be, if, if you do everything you're supposed to do for special study groups, and if you're excused from the final, that means your grade is going to be based on 150 points. So homework, 25, clicking, 25, and then best two out of three midterms, another 100, total of 150. So you won't have to worry about the final. Okay, and it'll be 90% uh, for A, so that's uh, 135 points. 75% uh, for B, whatever 75% of 150 is and so forth, okay? All right, now let's talk about SSG. Uh, you SSG leaders, I've already talked to a few of you. I need, to, I need you to uh, schedule your SSG somewhere between Friday afternoon and Wednesday night. And I originally on the printout, I asked for Thursday uh, Mivash, are you, what, do you, what is yours? Tuesday. 
Tuesday. Tuesday? Okay, so you're good. So the rest of you guys, um, if you were thinking about Thursday, no. Make it Friday, 4 p.m. or later, all the way up to Wednesday night. Okay, and then, and then everybody that goes to your SSG will be ready for either this exam or for the um, morning section uh, final exam, which is a different date. All right, now, um, the location, you may try a different location if you want. No, you know, you can, it, so if you were in Hercules and you want to be in the library study room, yeah, that's good. Just try to get a, a library a room reserved and uh, they work pretty good. But whatever you think is good, all right? Um, and, and we'll get it uh, put in the schedule pages as always. Uh, where to meet up before the meeting. I want you to be a specific. If you don't have a library room specifically reserved, then you have to have a location where you're going to rendezvous before the actual meeting starts so that everybody can catch up and then go to the meeting room that you've got in mind. So, because, you know, they can't read your mind. Uh, so just saying benches in front of the library is no good because there's a ton of benches out there. So that could be, you know, and people don't want to miss the SSG. So uh, be real specific. Same thing with your identifying features. I had a student, I don't know if, if the student is in here or not. We got a student, student last go around, said, we all, uh, I'll be wearing sweatpants. And uh, that's not really cutting it for, uh, for being specific. It's not a very good identifying feature. So uh, make it a little bit more um, clear. And what we'll do is as soon as, and I, I, I understand that some of you has, have sent me stuff. Um, some of you are going to send me stuff. Um, and uh, I'll put it in the new schedule page. And on the top of the new schedule page is a uh, image of minions. This, this particular image that will tell you that you're on the right schedule page. So those of you that want to sign up for a special study group, um, your signups are going to start Thursday night again at 9 p.m. All right, so the Buffalo Stampede will pr proceed at 9 p.m. Thursday night, and hopefully you can get in there and get a spot. All right, and between now and Thursday, keep an eye on the schedule page, Kim, and you'll be able to see which one you want to, you know, join stuff like that. And then at 9 p.m. on Thursday, ching, get in there. And, or 901, uh, get in there and, and click. King. Um, the SSG, um, the email address, the email address, or I'll take it right now. If you, if you, do you have everything? Well, at the end of class. Yeah, just give it to me after class. Uh, yeah, so that's good. No, you don't. The, the rest of you guys don't have to print them. If you, if you printed out a thing and filled it out, that's good. Uh, and we'll take it up front. A couple of people already have done that. But if, if not, you just... Send it to me in, in uh, the messaging system. That'll be sufficient. Okay. Now, last comment to you as we close up the semester, uh, and it's been a fun semester, I have to admit. Um, we have, I have a lot of uh, work, and, and Caroline's been helping me, and Darian, the other TA, has been helping me with grading and stuff, but we still have a lot of stuff that we got to, get squared away. And if, if you think about it, you look around the room, there's, there's a couple hundred students in here, and then there's a couple hundred students in the other section. And so there's a lot of odds and ends to tie together and summarize the stuff. Uh, but we'll be doing that in the next week. So be patient with Dr. B. And be alert for changes in the grades page. And I'll try to put a little blurb in discussions or something when I make a major upgrade. All right. Questions about all this stuff? Carolyn. To turn in your attendance sheets? Oh, good question. SSG leaders, I want you to turn in your attendance sheets before... Section 2 final, which is next Thursday, okay? Now, 
If I'm in my office, you can just hand it straight to me. All right? Right after. You know, you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait until next Thursday. If you, when, is, when are you going to be doing yours? Okay, so if you do yours like Wednesday afternoon, and I'm a, I'll probably be around Wednesday afternoon photocopying exams, and you can catch me, um, then just drop it off then, and then you're done. Okay, you'll be officially just, uh, excused from the final. Uh, but if you if you can't, you know, if you're you know hectic and stuff, you'll always be able to catch me here, 10 a.m. on finals day. All right. And so you can drop it off then, but no later than that. All right. Um, so if you go earlier, you know, which I know some of you are going to be doing on Monday, it's good. Just uh, slide over to the physical science building on Tuesday afternoon or, you know, whenever you can fit it into your schedule. And then and then that'll be good. All right. And if I, if I'm and then, Carolyn, if I'm not in my office. All right. Do not slip it under the door of my office. <coughs> Do not do that, but take it up to the fourth floor, to the physics office, room 430, on the fourth floor, and give it to the front desk person, and they'll put it in my faculty mailbox, and that'll be good. And then, when you've done that, just send me a message in web courses. Dr. B, I just dropped off my attendance sheet, and I'll have the front desk person scan it for me and I and I'll be able to eyeball it, or I'll be there and pick it up myself and then you'll be dismissed as soon as I get that you'll be officially excused from the final but not before okay another question about SSG and grades and stuff question you have a question yes go ahead For dropping it off, you can you can go to my office, um, and hopefully I'll be around. All right, and if like I said, if I'm not there, you can bring it upstairs to room four thirty. No, I, I I'll probably post times. I'll I'll pro I'll try to have some mega office hours on Wednesday. Uh, in the morning. Uh, but other than that, usually, usually I'm here and there. I, I'm I'm usually in the physics department. If I'm not in my office, I might be up in the physics office getting coffee, or I might be, um, you know, maybe in a seminar or something like that. But and you'll see a little note. I'll, I'll be back in five minutes or something on my door. Okay, so, All right. So it'll it'll be good. And you can and the other thing you can do is just. Send me a message in web courses and say, Dr. B, are you around? I'm ready with my attendance sheet, and that'll be good. And we'll figure out where I am and stuff. Abigail, did you have a question? Anything else? Okay, let's go back to this um, concept of quantum waves. We were talking about the hydrogen atom last time, and, and we stopped here um, with de Broglie's uh, rather surprising conjecture that, yeah, the hydrogen atom makes a lot of sense, complete sense, if, atom, if electrons behave as waves behave. In other words, if an electron that we formerly thought was a particle actually behaves in the manner that waves do. Now, if you think about waves, you know, waves are extended. A baseball has a specific location. You can identify uh, a, an object like a baseball or a bicycle or a dump truck or a molecule. Well, molecules, uh, let's think of macroscopic objects here. Baseball, dump truck, uh, Bicycle, baseball hat, uh, computer, cell phone that people are looking at instead of looking. Good. Um, 
you can identify center of mass, okay? But what's the center of mass of a wave? Does a wave even have mass? A wave has energy, and it, 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 it transports energy and momentum, but it doesn't really have, a, for instance, a center of mass. But particles do. So de Broglie said, yeah, this thing that we think is a particle, let's pretend or let's, let's compute with it as if it has wave properties. All right, now, I think we went over this diagram. Let's take a look at it again. The whole thing was, he said, if you say that an electron has wave properties and that the size of its orbit is controlled by the need for standing wave, constructive interference, you get it all. That's the key. De Broglie said, look, you know, if, if the electron is a wave, and if we say that it occupies orbits for which the wavelength is one orbit, I get constructive interference on that orbit, but not on any other orbit. And that's how nature, and de Broglie said, that's how nature chooses orbits. So that the wave, you know, the electron that can, you know, have a, in a wave, in a bound situation like that, can have a specific wavelength that, and, and get uh, constructive interference. Now let's compare that to Caroline uh, and I uh, doing, or maybe it was Darian and me, doing the uh, wave demonstration with the coil spring. Okay, when we oscillated that at a certain wavelength or at a certain frequency, we got the fundamental mode, the bump, between Caroline and me that oscillated with the dip between Caroline and me. It was actually waves going left and right simultaneously, but if you get the right frequency and the right wavelength, they look as if they're standing in place, oscillating from a bump to a dip, and back to a bump, and back to a dip. And that's the fundamental mode. Now the ground state is similar to that. If, if you're in an atom and you have the, the Coulomb interaction between the nucleus positives, the protons and the nucleus, and the electron, that controls the momentum, okay? And it also controls the, the, the positions of the orbits. And you get one frequency and one wavelength. And... The same thing with the, the n equals 2 state. This second circle out is meant to represent the n equals 2. Now, this is kind of a fanciful diagram. The electron waves don't look exactly like that. But the idea is that you have one frequency and one uh, lambda. However, on the n equals 2, or first excited state, you have a slightly higher frequency and a slightly smaller wavelength as a result. And so, um, but you only have one. So remember, when we were doing the coil spring demonstration, you had to have the right frequency. If you have the right frequency, at the second excited state, you'll get a, a bump and a dip oscillating with a dip and a bump, like this, all right, back and forth. But if you don't get right, just that right frequency, it's all discombobulated. It, you don't really get a standing wave. But as soon as you get it just to the right frequency, you know, you kind of slow down or speed up a little bit, and then all of a sudden, bam, you got it. And Caroline, I th was it you and me that did it? Caroline and I did it, and we got it up to the second excited state, an even higher frequency. But until we got to just that frequency, we just, you know, the, the, the coil spring was all, you know, disorganized. It wasn't, it wasn't jack. But once we got to that frequency, bing, and that's what we got. That's what de Broglie said. You've got something similar. Now, it's not a coil spring, but it's similar to that. It's actually similar to musical instruments. Go ahead and make a note of this. You know, if you have a guitar string, there's, as soon as you put that guitar together and you, and you um, stretch it to the right tension, you know, you tune it so it's on key, um, you'll get certain wave modes 
and only certain wave modes, and they'll all be harmonic. It'll, it'll sound great, okay? Same with, thing with a piano. And actually, a wind instrument is much more complicated, but those have uh, certain uh, waveforms and, and uh, wave modes that you control by the valves and stuff. And I've never really taken apart a wind instrument, uh, but I know, um, you know, like a trumpet or something like that, but I know they have valves and stuff, so I should try to do that one time. I have a friend that's a, a, an excellent trumpet player. I'll have to ask him about that. Anyways, a musical, uh, guitar, a musical instrument like a guitar, yeah. So there's nothing that fancy about the idea that, they're, that you know, standing waves have a certain wavelength and frequency. It's just that, you know, de Broglie said, let's get these particles, let's see if they behave like waves. And the thing about it is, it worked, it worked perfectly. You know, it matched all the dimensions that they knew, all the energy levels. Um, it all worked out for the hydrogen atom. It worked perfectly. It was very successful. Now, I want to talk about Newton's second law and third law. Let me ask you a clicker question. Go ahead and get your clicker out. And actually, you know what? Go ahead and vote with this. See, that's actually, look at that, AA. That's probably not ours. That's probably somebody else's. Oh, we're going to leave it here. You still uh, want me to vote with it. Huh? You still want me to vote with it. Yeah, change it to BB. Yeah, I did. Okay. All right. Clicker question number one for today. Which of these equations is a version of Newton's second law? Let's see if these guys do better. Thirty seconds. Ten. No. Sorry. False alarm. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one, zero. Uh, students, this is the answer, but unfortunately, we have a, a little bit of uh, trouble with this. A lot of you, all, I'm very disappointed uh, that more of you did not score correctly on that one. Make a note of it. Don't let me catch you on, napping on the final. I, actually, this is good. Uh, because it, it, it re should remind you to get ready for the final. Josh, get ready for everything, baby, because it's coming at you. Even Newton's second law. I told you we'd be talking about it for the whole semester, and we are. You know? so, so anyways, um, let's talk about the second and third law. Um, here's the impulse equation, F delta T equals delta P. Uh, and in this, for, for the atom the interaction force is the Coulomb interaction, all right? Now, de Broglie said, all right, I think that, that the way the hydrogen atom works is that the, the, the electron has wave properties, therefore a wavelength and a frequency, and all of that is controlled by the strength of the Coulomb interaction. Or in, in Newton's second law here, F delta T equals delta P, the uh, interaction force F. Now here's what he said. Here's how, uh, notice that the other side of Newton's second law here is delta P, the change in the momentum. And that's what de Broglie said. Let's anchor the wave particle property or the wave property lambda wavelength to the momentum, to the MV momentum. And this is the uh, famous de Broglie relation. Lambda equals H, Planck's constant, divided by MV. And that's MV the momentum. All right, so the Coulomb interaction controls the momentum state, IE or EG, 
F delta T equals delta P, the impulse equation. So you've got an impulse system. Good, so you know that, it, that the size of the interaction is controlling that. Um, and then de Broglie said, all right, let's use that momentum state to define wavelength using Planck's constant. And it therefore has to fit this formula, H, Planck's constant, divided by the momentum, MV. All right. And he found that it jibes with everything about hydrogen. So he took this concept and found that, for instance, the H alpha that we were looking at on Thursday last week, and H beta, that kind of aqua, uh, kind of blue, almost bluish green line, and then the two purpley ones, H gamma and H delta. Yeah, all those things under de Broglie's hypothesis about waves, it all works, it all perfectly matches. And now there is a reason why nature um, chooses certain orbits. Basically, it's the same way. It's for the same reason that, that guitars, um, guitar strings produce certain notes and no others. Once that physical wave system is set, either by the, the, the tension in the guitar string or the strength of the Coulomb interaction, once that's set, you get certain waves and only certain waves, whether it's the fundamental, the first excited state, second excited state, or on up with the higher harmonics. Same thing with um, atoms and the electrons in orbit around them. So the, the, in terms of Newton's second law, yeah, F delta T, that is, is where the Coulomb interaction, and over here, delta P, the change in the momentum, that encodes as the lambda, the wavelength, and the frequency. Frequency is a little tr trickier to do. But wavelength is, is very nice. Wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So de Broglie was able to say, based on my knowledge of H alphas, and based on uh, Bohr and Einstein saying that those H alphas correspond to uh, certain color photons, certain wavelengths, certain energies, he said, if all those are true, then the electrons have to have certain wavelengths controlled by the Coulomb interaction, all right? And for hydrogen, it's the easiest one. It's a proton interacting with an electron. That's it. Very simple. Helium, it's a couple protons in the nucleus interacting with one of the, one of the electrons. And hydrogen, a helium comes with two electrons. So there's two of them in there. All right. Uh, neon, it's 10 protons in the nucleus. And each of those 10 electrons orbiting, they each interact, you know, one electron with a... 10 proton uh, charge in the nucleus. So every single atom has a, every different kind of atom, uh, atom either neon or, or carbon, iron, zinc, magnesium. They all have different nuclei. They all have different interaction strengths. It's like different guitars and violins, different kind of strings, but they all play very specific notes. Right? They all have fundamental states, ground states. They all have first excited states and so on. All right? So it's, it's like a bunch of different musical instruments, actually. Now here's a question. Everybody was happy about what de Broglie explained. They said, you know, this really explains a lot. But is it really true? Does, a, does an electron really have wave properties? Does it diffract? Right? Will an electron diffract? Because, you know, heretofore, you know, J.J. Thompson thought of the electron as a particle. It had a mass, had a charge, you know, it had a location, you know, just like a basketball, baseball, bicycle, dump truck. All those things can be located. You know, we don't think of a dump truck as a particle, but it's a physical object that has a center of mass, and that we can locate and treat dynamically. Now, we know that, you know, ocean waves diffract, but do, uh, do electrons diffract? Look at this picture. It's waves coming through that little gap 
See that little headland, little rim? I don't know where that picture is. It's probably in Hawaii or something like that. It looks like black volcanic rock. But there's a gap, and when the waves come crashing through the gap, they, they diffract around the gap. They don't go straight through. And they come, they're coming in from a certain direction, but once they go through that gap, they spread out as if they're re-emitted, you know, like, like ripples going out from a pond, all right? We know that light waves diffract. Remember this? Thursday, we were using uh, diffraction gratings like this. Here's a picture of the uh, diffraction of light. Remember that? We got the rainbows. Rainbows to the left, rainbows to the right. And here's a little diagram. This is kind of an idealized picture of a diffraction grating. It's a piece of transparent plastic with the, the lines photocopied on, parallel lines. So the diffraction pattern looks like... Uh, tall lines, each of a certain color, all right? But so that's light waves. That's nice. So ocean waves, yeah. Light waves, yeah. We can, we, we saw that, you know. And hydrogen had certain colors, not all the colors of the rainbow, but, you know, we got them to diffract uh, and, and isolated those colors. We dispersed the colors. But do electrons do that? And the answer to that is, yes, they do. The guys that figured it out, very famous pair of Americans, uh, Davison and Germer. And about 1927, they were studying nickel crystals, crystals of the metal nickel. All right. And the interesting thing is they were sending electrons into these crystals. And that's like sending photons of light, waves of light, into a diffraction grating. So they didn't have a, they didn't even know that an electron would diffract. They were just sending them into nickel crystals. But the regular arrangement of atoms of nickel into a crystal formed a diffraction grating of sorts and the electrons diffracted. And they observed it. Now their pic they didn't make a photograph, but in in our day, we make photographs. This is what it looks like. Take a look at this. All of you that are looking down at your computers, take a look now. All right. I don't see everybody looking. Come on, ROTC. Yeah, oh no, you're not ROTC. We're the ROTC guys. And they're over there, you guys back there. Okay, look, look at this, All right? Now this is, this is what you see when you have a bunch of crystals. Now that, so what they do is they, they take a couple, uh, a couple microscope slides and they sprinkle nickel crystals over it, finely ground, very small ones, and then they sandwich them between the two clear panes of glass and they shine the electrons through them. They zoom, they zoom the electrons through them. So there's no specific, you know, so the, the crystals are not all organized up and down like a diffraction grating. You know, they're all every which way, but they'll still diffract. They'll diffract. So some of them, you know, like when we had our diffraction gratings, I told you, orient it so that you have the rainbows left and right. But if you had the, the diffraction grating tilted, you'd have rainbows 30 degrees up and 30 degrees down on the other side. If you tilted it a little bit more, 45 degrees up and 45 degrees down on the other side. A little bit more, 60. And all the way. And so if you have a set of diffraction gratings all at different orientations, you'll get a ring of rainbows. The same thing here. If you have a, um, a slew of small nickel crystals and you're beaming your electrons through, You'll get the central image. So go ahead and make a, a picture of this if you can. Um, here's the central image, that very bright central dot. Most of the electron energy goes there. But now you can see this first bright ring out here. That's because some of the nickel crystals are like this, some are like this, some are like this. You know, all different degrees of, of orientation. Okay. And so you get diffraction out there. Now, there's more, it's, it's hard to see them. 
Uh, I guess maybe over here you can see it's a little brighter over here. But you can see other rings. And that's what we saw when we looked at hydrogen. We saw specific colors. You know, you know H alpha. And then we saw uh, H beta, that kind of blue aqua. And then some of you saw the kind of purpley blue ones a little closer. The same thing here. So the brightest one is this one right here, this first ring out. But actually, these scientists, and this is a picture from 2011, uh, Gareth E. Haslam, Chao Yao Chin, and G. Tim Burstein, physical chemistry, chemical physics. Uh, they were studying nickel and car encapsulated in carbon. Uh, yeah, this is what they saw. And if you look carefully, um, you'll see up here these letters. See that at the very top right of the image? FCC, and then, then the symbol NI for nickel, and then 111 in parentheses. Now what that means is you have a face-centered cubic crystal, FCC, face-centered cubic, and you're looking at it in uh, what's, what's called the 111 configuration. Right? And I'll show you some of those configurations later. And then the next ring out, 200 configuration. So you're looking at a slightly different angle on the same kind of a crystal. And then 220, and then 311. So you, what you're picking up here are electrons zipping through. Actually, you're looking at different diffraction gratings. All the electrons are the same flavor, the same energy but they are interacting with different diffraction gratings. Whereas what we had was different colors interacting with one diffraction grating when we got different uh, spectral lines left and right. This one, you're getting the different rings because of different crystal orientations. So you can um, find out a lot of information by studying images like this of electron diffraction. And my wonderful students, we still use electron diffraction um, to study atoms and molecules. It's one of our basic tools. Abigail. You said the reason they're the rings is not because of like the presence of electrons, because it's because of the crystals and stuff? Yeah, the crystals are, are different orientations. When you see rings like this, and actually you see some, if you look at it carefully on the internet, on YouTube, it's time for me to sneeze. <laughs> Every day at this time. There must be some kind of a... Actually, I can hear the, the air going. Um, what you've got is, as I said, if you, if you take the diffraction gradient, instead of looking at it like this... <coughs> oh, that's two. Two sneezes. So if you look at the diffraction grid, you know, you hold it like this, you get left and right diffraction lines. But if you hold it like this, you, you rotate it 90 degrees, you get diffraction lines up, up above. So if, if, if all the diffraction gradings were at random angles, you'd have, you'd have diffraction grades that form a ring. You know, you'd have a red ring, outer, and then inside of that, a blue aqua, the H beta. And then inside of that, the two H, gamma, and delta, the purpley ones, but they'd form uh, rings. And then you have the, the kind of purpley, pinkish central image. If you were looking at a zillion randomly oriented uh, diffraction rings, and that's what the, the nickel is. I mean, it, you, know, you can either take one solid crystal and analyze it, uh, but what this is, for some reason they do you know, a zillion, they grind it up and, and, and look at a zillion of them. Yeah. All right, let's calculate some wavelengths. All right, and have your clickers ready because we're going to do a clicker, and a little bit tougher of a clicker question. Um, but to do the clicker questions, we're going to do two different, ver we're going to use two different versions of Planck's constant. The first one, H equals 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. That's the metric system value of Planck's constant H. And the other one that we're going to use for atomic systems 
know, 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volt seconds. And uh, that one is good because in the atomic level, Anthony, you want to do electron volts. So if you're doing molecules, atoms, nuclei and stuff, you want to think of electron volts. But if you're doing baseballs, dump trucks, stuff like that, you want to think metric system, kilograms, meters, and seconds. Okay, so uh, we're going to do two calculations. Um, you're going to do a macroscopic calculation using this version. So when you're doing, it, it doesn't really matter which one you use, but for macroscopic objects measured in kilograms and going a few meters per second, you'll use this one. But for submicroscopic objects, I recommend this one. And I'll guide you through um, a calculation uh, of this kind in yellow, the submicroscopic objects. Okay, so make it, jot those down. Um, and that's what we're going to do right now. So let's, let's do an electron. And the, um, we're going to say that the momentum P of the electron is um, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 4 um, electron volt seconds per meter. All right. And remember, electron volt seconds is angular momentum. So angular momentum divided by a distance, divided by a meter, is regular momentum. Okay, so this is an atomic level uh, unit of, of uh, momentum. Now, if you work it out, you know, 1 half mv squared, uh, the kinetic energy is about 2250 electron volts. And that's not a bad, it's a realistic kinetic energy for an electron. Its speed is about 9% of the speed of light. So it's whipping. But we can get electrons, we can easily get electrons up to 99% of the speed of light. That's not, because electrons are really small. We can get protons up to 99% of the speed of light. Uh, they're bigger, but we can still do it. You know, these big atom smashers like they have over there in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, they can do that. So this is realistic. Uh, so let's do this formula. Lambda equals H over P. All right. And let's plug in what we know. Now, I told you on this system, we're working with subatom or with submicroscopic. We're working on an electron. We'll use 4.14 times 10 to the minus 15 electron volt seconds. Four Planck's constant. Down the bottom, you put the momentum. Now, I gave you the momentum, all right? And when you're going to be doing your, when you get to your homework tonight, all right, which hopefully you'll do, uh, you'll, I'll give you a momentum, you know, 18.4 times 10 to the minus 5 electron volt seconds per meter or whatever I give you. Right, and then you figure out wavelength. All right, so there's your plug-in step. Now, I'll, I'll, I want to draw your attention to a couple things here. First of all, in the numerator, you have electron volt seconds. And actually, um, in Elizabeth, in the denominator, you also have electron volt seconds. Okay, so those cancel. The denominator has per, per meter in the momentum down there. Now that doesn't cancel, right? So make a note, the denominator has meters to the minus one or per meter. So that being in the denominator, Elizabeth, I'm looking at both of you, means that in the numerator, it's the same as regular meters in the numerator. All right, so here's what we got. Next line, second line of my equation block, 4.14 and 1.6. Okay, that's the numeric part. So this is if you're doing this on paper and you don't have your calculator and you got to try to handle all the scientific notation. 10 to the minus 15 and 10 to the minus 4 in the denominator. Okay, that's like 10 to the regular 4 in the numerator. So 10 to the minus 15, take 10 to the regular 4 is equal to 10 to the minus 11. So this over here, uh, the power of 10 in the second line of my equation block, 10 to the minus 11, all right? And then meters in the numerator, 
of my uh, expression here. Good? All right. Now you just got to calculate uh, 4.14 divided by 1.6. All right, so it's going to be 2 point something. Right, so you calculate it out. 2.59, and we're done. Now, if we were doing a written test and you stopped here, I'd give you full points. On homework and on exam, the final exam, if I give you a question like this, you'll do clicking. And even if I give it to you in multiple choice, I might ask you, you know, I might give you an answer in nanometers. All right, now how do you figure out nanometers? Let me ask you a question. This is a mental IQ test. It's not a quick question. But let me ask you this. 2.59 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. Is that bigger or smaller than a nanometer? It's bigger, right? Because it's 10 to the minus 11. Right? Javier, is that, is that what you... Wake up, 10 to the minus 11 is bigger than 10 to the minus 9, right? I mean, a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. So 10 to the minus 11, because 11 is bigger than 9, right? So, so this would be bigger than a nanometer? DJ? It is. It's smaller. Don't let me, don't let me burn you. Don't let me shake you. All right? I just shook a bunch of you. Yeah, it's smaller. It's two point it's zero point zero two five nine nanometers. Okay? So ten to the minus nine. So move the decimal two point places to the right. Excuse me, two places to the left, and then change it to ten to the minus nine, and that'll be a nanometer. So zero point zero two five nine nanometers. My wonderful students, I want you to remember something. Um, and we're going to do the clickers in just a second here. On clicking, when you're doing numeric answers, you can't put in the decimal point first. You have to put, for, for an answer like this, it's, you got to put the zero in and then the decimal point. And then 0259. All right. And I think it's similar in web courses. I think you'll call, if you put in point 0259 in web courses, I think web courses doesn't like that. All right. But definitely the eye clicker doesn't. Also, my wonderful students, you're about to start a, a clicker question um, and calculate. And I want you to be very careful about. And this is because we just did the same question in the previous class. Be careful with the minus sign and the equal sign. They look very similar. All right, so we're going to turn the lights on for you here in just a second. But before we do, um, let's just take a look at this picture. Here's some crystals. And I want you to look at this picture. The crystal, you're looking at the hexagonal face of it head on in the top two pictures. On the right, on top, you can see the kind of blue shape. Can you turn the lights all the way off? Yeah. Let me see it a little bit better in the dark. Okay. Um, up here, the top row, you're kind of looking straight down on the top of a hexagonal crystal. So the electrons come through in that orientation. They make this diffraction pattern over here to the left. All right. Now, when you rotate... The crystal, 90 degrees, you're looking at it like this from the side, all right? And when you do that and when you drill those electrons through, they're going to sprinkle out into these directions. So it's kind of a, so it's kind of, it's not like a, a regular diffraction grating where you just have one direction. You know, if you had a regular diffraction grating, you just have electrons going left and electrons going right and then electrons going straight through for the central image. This one, no. So here, right here where my cursor is, there's the central image. And then these tinier dots around there, they're because you interact with, you know, you're acting with different diffraction gradients. You're acting, you're interacting with diffraction gradients. Think of each of those planes 
as forming a diffraction grating, right? And they're, so now you're looking at diffraction gratings that are tilted with respect to you, all right? And the third level, um, take the, the, the middle one and rotate a few degrees, I think it's 60 degrees, and you get this orientation. Drill the electrons through, and you get an even different diffraction pattern, all right? And so that's what individual crystal diffraction patterns would look like. So looking at th these, these pictures on the left, these black and white dots, you can bring the pictures up, or the light up now. Uh, those dots over there on the left will tell you a lot about the structure of the crystals you might not be able to see, right? Matter of fact, using not electrons, but using x-rays, they were able to figure out the double helix structure of DNA in this way. They were looking at X-ray diffraction, not electron diffraction. But this is electron diffraction here. All right, let's do wavelength for another object in motion. And hit the refresh key on your calculator. This one you're going to be typing in an answer. It's numeric but I want you to give the answer in scientific notation. So it's going to be something point something, something point something something, and then E, and, and then a minus something. All right? And you're typing that in. All right, so hit the refresh key, and you'll be able to... So do your calculation. Now this one, hey, you guys, use the metric. Okay? And you've got a, a paper clip. That's a... a uh, a mass of 0 0.001 kilogram. So momentum, 2.65 times 10 to the minus 3 kilogram meters per second. Put that in the denominator and uh, crank it out. All right. And I'll give you a few minutes for that. Go ahead and jot that down. And then I'll turn the lights up so you have a little bit of light to. Not yet. Not yet. We'll have to give them a minute. Copy this stuff down. The momentum and then. Price constant. Start. Listen to those clicks. Boy. I don't know how you get that. Okay, go ahead and turn on the lights. Uh-oh, somebody just typed in E equals and then a number. No, no, no. Make sure we turn the lights on. So make sure you're, you're doing E and then minus. There we go. That looks better. I'm not saying your answer is right, but you, you're doing your symbols correctly. Now I can hear those clickers clicking. Ten to the minus eleven is is the example. That's not. I mean, that's not going to be a right answer. This is nice. I can't do it all. Yeah, what's up, Elizabeth? You can. We'll, yeah, we'll be able to see it. We'll be able to grade it properly. Were you able to grade it? Pretty yeah. easily. Yeah. Okay. You just clicked on them. Okay. See, we usually grade that these kind of questions. Elizabeth, we usually grade these questions right after you guys do them. So we'll be able to do it. Kim, you look really bored. Don't fall asleep. Kim, don't fall asleep. I know it's not the music that's going into your earphones.
Probably not. I see some errors here. DJ, you got it? Dude! I was like, I'm ready to go on this Yay! Give him this one. Huh? Yeah. Give him this one. Turn it off then. Okay, turn it back on. It should be BB. What is your last name again? Look at this. Oh, well. It's the new. Oh, look at this. It's oscillating between answers. Yeah. Correct it's answers. The most ones, maybe. No, it's the correct ones. The ones that okay, I. Okay, yeah. That, I, that you clicked on. Yeah. It's interesting. That's cool. You guys are doing good. All right, uh, 30 seconds. If you if you if you want to yes uh, you don't have to though we can grade it either way just about got it good DJ you got it okay ten seconds ten nine eight seven six five four three Two. One. DJ. See if you can type it in. I'll give you a second. And it's a pain in the neck. The, e the equal and the minus sign, the students told me last hour, was a very confusing. It's because the lighting here is so pathetic. Yeah, and then the cursor. And the cursor is not very big. It's, it's just. It's a struggle. It's a struggle. It is. <laughs> it's poor design. It's like. kind of like the struggle to, Natalie. It's kind of like the struggle to get through the semester. Yeah. Without enough vacation time. If we had spring break every other week, I could get through the semester. Know, right? like, but no. Do they ever do it that way? No. I could handle it. I'd find a way to handle it. Come on. Okay, good. Close it. Let's see what we got. Here we go. Closer, closer. Good. Uh, go back up a little bit. Uh, good. Uh, go down. Let me give you this one here. And this one. My, my fingers are... There we go. 
And that one. Okay, go um, go uh, bring it up to the display. Go back to presentation mode. Okay, now what we're looking at here are your answers. Um, and all these are correct. 2.5 times 10 to the minus 31. And now, see this one? Let's, let's get this one to narrows. And there's some good ones here. This one's good. Can you see that turning green? All right. Now, 2.34 e to the minus 12. Hmm, I don't know how that one. Uh, e to the minus 11. So you can see there's some errors here. Mm -hmm. But a lot of you got it right. Go ahead and switch it now back to this. So um, raise your hand if you got 2.5 times 10 to the minus 31. Okay, good. All right. Um, now, go ahead and jot that down as the correct answer. And then let me point out a couple things. This is the momentum for, uh, or you use the momentum for a paper clip going a few miles per hour. 2.65 is about 5 point something miles per hour. Right? That's walking speed. Now, the wavelength is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 31 meters. That is extremely small, and it is, most, it is so small compared to other macroscopic objects through which the paperclip might move. You know, you, you see a wave when the wave goes through a gap or around an edge. You'll see diffraction effects. But the gap has got to be the right size. If the gap is too big, you don't really get too much diffraction. Okay, But if the gap and the wavelength are about the same size or close, you know, maybe if you, uh, you know, maybe double or maybe triple the size, uh, you'll get diffraction. But not with this. There is no... F so if I try to see... Look at the regular... Look at the seats around you. The seats around you. Regular spacing, right? So I could maybe use the seats in here as a diffraction gradient, but not with paper clips, because the separation is so much bigger. The door, you know that first picture we had, uh, you know, of a gap in the, in the headland in the ocean, and it was just one opening, and the waves came through, and they diffracted on the other side of the gap. That door would be a gap for paper clip. Go through that. You know, the ocean wave went through that gap, and the ocean waves were about the right size to produce diffraction for a gap that size. Uh, but the, the wavelength of the paperclip is so small that going through the door, you know, any, any kind of a human-sized object, like your pocket, forget it. You're never, and that is why macroscopic objects like you and Earth, dump trucks, even blood cells, they're pretty small, they're microscopic, they do not display quantum effects. But electrons, yes. Right? Because electrons, if they're not going too fast, will have a, a, a wavelength that's just right for diffracting through stuff like crystals of uh, nickel or aluminum or any other kind of crystal you want. All right, dynamical state of the electron. Let's talk about this a little bit for the next half hour. We know that the energy levels are controlled by the Coulomb interaction and, and the fact that only certain levels will permit constructive interference in accordance with de Broglie's hypothesis using the Planck's, using Planck's constant H. And those energy levels where constructive interference holds for the electron, um, they'll define orbital energies. And the differences in the orbital energies is something that we can see through H alpha. Now, H and, and the other uh, colors of the spectrum of hydrogen. H alpha is the, is the red one. H beta is the kind of bluish green one. 
the aqua uh, spectral line of hydrogen. Looking at the color, measuring the wavelength, we can figure out the energy gaps between orbits. All right? And that's how we know that uh, de Broglie's hypothesis was correct. The other dynamical variable that you have to take into account is the angular momentum of the electron. Energy, yep. And also it's angular momentum. And it can have two different kinds. You know, the Earth going around the sun has or what we call orbital angular momentum simply because it goes around the sun once every 365 days, right, one lap. But also, the, and, and so it's, it's, it's on a circular, you know, motion. It has angular momentum. But also the Earth is spinning once every 24 hours. So Earth also has spin angular momentum. Same thing with the electron. It has intrinsic spin. We don't know why electrons have that. It seems to be this um, irreducible effect of electrons that they have spin angular momentum. Now, why is that important? Well, the angular momentum state can be revealed by very precise observations of the spectral lines of hydrogen. So the diffraction lines will reveal it. Now, we can't do it in the, in the lecture hall here, but if we were in the lab and we put a sample of hydrogen, you know, we take, took that same tube, you know, the one that I broke uh, in lecture on Thursday, um, and hopefully I don't break it this time, but put it between the two poles, the north and south poles, of a big electromagnet, then that magnetic field will interact with the or angular momentum states and cause the, the spectral lines, it'll actually cause them to split. You'll, instead of having one line, you'll have several spectral lines. Slightly different colors, slightly different wavelengths, and it, in the lab you'll be able to see them. You can't see them. They're pretty close together, so you wouldn't be able to see them here. But in the lab, yeah. So all that stuff, the spin angular momentum, the orbital angular momentum, and of course the orbital energy, those are all the factors that control uh, the orbits and actually the outgoing photons of light, the outgoing colors. We can, we can uh, under different conditions, you know, strong magnetic field, no magnetic field, uh, look at all the different colors of hydrogen, all the different colors of helium, every element has its own fingerprints. You know, neon looks way different from hydrogen, right? Because it has way different energy levels, way different angular momentum states. And all of that's encoded here in the periodic table, right? The periodic table, the structure of it is oriented the way it is because of orbital energies and orbital angular Momentum and spin angular momentum, right? For instance, H is up here because it has a very simple orbital energy set. Now down here, if you were to take something like uh, element number 77, iridium, much different spectrum. Very complicated. This is a big atom, a lot of energy levels, a big nucleus, 77 protons. That's a serious actor. And right next to it, uh, two spots over, gold, AU. And one spot over to the right of that, HG, that's mercury. And they're all different. All right. Now, uh, make a note, webelements.com. You can look all the cool stuff up, all the spectra, at least the numbers. You might not see a photo. See all the spectra in webelements.com. It looks like this. Okay. Um, so let's, let's break off there for today and dismiss. You'll have some homework tonight uh, due on Thursday. I'll see you then. You're dismissed. I'll have to remember that. Let me start up here. Thanks for the